A massive heat wave shuts down Chinese factories. More U.S. officials visit Taiwan, and China's zero COVID policy locks down IKEA. And more on this week's China News Headlines. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Incogni. You probably know that companies are collecting your personal data, but you may not realize just how many. Dozens, maybe hundreds, most of which you've never heard of. And you have no idea what they're doing with your data. Incogni helps you stop them. I'll explain more at the end. And it looks like uh, there's a popular new travel spot for U.S. officials, Taiwan. Less than two weeks after U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi led a congressional delegation to Taiwan, another delegation landed there. This one was a bipartisan group of lawmakers led by Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey. Senator Markey said during the trip that he's long promoted closer ties with Taiwan. Which is true. Markey has been in Congress for so long that he actually voted for the Taiwan Relations Act, which passed in 1979. That's 43 years ago. Has anyone in Congress heard of retirement? Anyway, Markey and his delegation met with Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen. Which is great, but I kind of wonder whether President Tsai is getting tired of meeting with congressional delegations. According to the U.S. State Department, at least 10 congressional delegations have visited Taiwan already this year. And it looks like they're just going to keep coming. It's like when you invite friends over to stay and they discover that your apartment building has a roof deck and a pool. Then word spreads and more and more people want to stay with you and every weekend you have to inflate the air mattress all over again. I hate that thing. Well, Taiwan better invest in a pullout couch because it's not just U.S. lawmakers that are coming to stay. A Japanese lawmaker is set to visit next week. Canadian lawmakers are planning a trip in the fall. And a Lithuanian deputy minister visited Taiwan last week which probably wouldn't have made international headlines, except that China then sanctioned her for visiting Taiwan. Has anyone in the Chinese Communist Party heard of the Streisand effect? And in more good news, the U.S. and Taiwan are going to hold official trade talks. According to the U.S. Trade Representative's office, the first round of negotiations will take place early this fall. We should be trading a lot more with Taiwan and a lot less with China, a country where the government uses rape as a form of torture. As you can imagine, the Chinese Communist Party has been reacting to all this positive attention for Taiwan totally normally. Well, totally normally for the Communist Party, so jealous rage. And more military drills. Plus, earlier this week, China sanctioned seven Taiwanese officials for being diehard Taiwan independent separatists. Those officials include the current de facto Taiwanese ambassador to the U.S., Xiaobi Kim, and legislator Wang Dingyu who I interviewed when we were in Taiwan in January 2020. The sanctioned officials don't seem to be too worried, though. One of them, Lin Fei-Fan, wrote on his Facebook page that people keep congratulating him for getting sanctioned. He also wrote, I think in this day and age, being sanctioned by an authoritarian regime should be a badge of honor for members of the free world. What I want to know is, when am I going to get sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party? I just get sanctioned by the YouTube algorithm. Speaking of, here's either a commercial break or a brief black screen. Welcome back. Five major Chinese state-owned companies have announced their delisting from the New York Stock Exchange. Which brings up the question, why were these major state-owned companies listed on Wall Street in the first place? Oh, right, so they could make hundreds of billions of dollars from foreign investors. The delisting is part of an ongoing battle between China and the U.S. over the fact that hundreds of Chinese companies are listed on Wall Street but don't follow U.S. auditing requirements. That's because they claim that some of their financial documents are state secrets. The SEC has threatened to delist more than 100 Chinese companies if they don't follow the rules within the next three years. I guess these companies were just getting ahead of the curve. And a sign that China's diplomacy in Europe is not going well, the Baltic states of Estonia and Latvia withdrew from a China cooperation group called the 16 plus 1. That's a group China established back in 2012. 
to promote relations with Central and Eastern European countries. They were the 16, China was the 1. It was supposed to boost economic and political ties, especially China's Belt and Road Initiative. Things seemed to be going well for a while. Greece joined in 2017, making it the 17 plus 1. But then the Chinese Communist Party's increasing aggressiveness started to backfire. Last year, Lithuania quit the group, and also encouraged other countries to quit. Of course, then Lithuania really pissed the Chinese regime off when it started to establish closer ties with Taiwan. So China cut off all trade with the country, which everyone called out as economic coercion, which didn't help China's case in Europe. And now that Estonia and Latvia are out of the 16 plus 1, I guess we should start calling it the 14 plus 1. I wonder whether we'll see more countries quitting soon. You know what they say, 3 makes a trend. But if China is slowly losing support in Europe, it still has a friend in Vladimir Putin. My favorite Chinese state-run media, The Global Times, thanked Putin for criticizing Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. And China and Russia continue to deepen their ties. Earlier this week, China announced it would participate in military exercises with Russia later this month. Speaking of China's military, a Chinese Navy ship has docked in a Sri Lankan port despite objections from India and the US. India and US officials had tried to get Sri Lanka to remove access to the port, which it didn't, but Sri Lanka did ask China to delay the Navy ship's arrival. It didn't work. This is the same port that China helped build in 2012. Then when Sri Lanka couldn't pay back the loan, China took it over in a 99-year lease. Some experts warn China could try to turn this port into a military base in the future, so you can see why the US and especially India were worried. More after the break. Welcome back. Parts of China are experiencing the worst heat wave in 60 years. The heat wave has been going on for more than two months now. Temperatures have been topping 104 degrees in 11 different provinces. That's also causing a huge drought, which the Chinese authorities are trying to solve by making it rain. As in, shooting chemicals into the clouds to literally make it rain. But that doesn't work when there's not enough clouds. The drought is so bad that the Yangtze River is at record lows. And that's a problem because the areas with the heat wave and drought also rely on hydroelectric power. Reservoirs are down by as much as half, which means it's time for the rolling blackouts. It's gotten so bad in Sichuan province that factories have been ordered to shut down for six days to ease the power shortage. That's another blow to China's economy after months of factory and port closures due to China's zero COVID policy. The factory shutdown affects companies that supply Tesla, Apple, Toyota, and a bunch of other international companies. Speaking of shutdowns, an IKEA in Shanghai suddenly went into lockdown after it was found that close contacts of a COVID case had shopped there that day. Videos of IKEA shoppers bursting out of the doors went viral. And of course, they were immediately censored. The reason people ran out of the store wasn't that they were afraid of COVID, they were afraid of being quarantined. And for good reason. Shanghai authorities announced that the store would go through closed loop management for two days, which means anyone who didn't get out of the store would have to undergo two days of quarantine at a government facility and five days of health surveillance. All of this because the close contacts of an asymptomatic positive case had been at the IKEA. It wasn't even clear if they were still at the IKEA when it got locked down. Zero COVID is going great. It's going so great that the city of Xiamen is testing the fish for COVID. It's not the first time this has happened, but a news report showing people swabbing live fish for COVID went viral and was heavily mocked online in China because it's pretty much impossible for fish to get COVID. But this is all part of the Chinese Communist Party's obsession with proving that zero COVID works. You see, the party is definitely controlling COVID outbreaks in China, which means that they have to blame any new COVID outbreaks as being imported into China, like through Canadian mail or fresh fish. Not sure people are buying that given the reaction to the fish story, but fear not, China's propaganda outlets know what to do. Censor the fish story by blurring it out online. Seriously, this is what it looks like now. Gosh, I wonder if people will find it a little fishy. And this episode has been sponsored by Incognito. 
Whenever you do anything online, there's a huge number of companies that collect your personal data. Look at all of them. And these are just the ones that collected my personal data. These unscrupulous companies collect things like your name, your email, your address, even your social security number. And what are they doing with this personal data? They're buying it, selling it, and trading it to other companies to sell you products or create a profile for you. And when these companies get hacked, you could be in big trouble. And yes, I said when, not if. Because according to the former head of the NSA, China has hacked every major corporation in the US. So if your data is out there, it's not safe. That's why you need to get your data taken offline. That's what Incogni does. Incogni forces these companies to delete your data using all the applicable laws. Theoretically, you could do it yourself if you knew what the laws were and how to write those companies with the correct type of request slash threat to remove your data. But that's an impossible amount of work. That's why Incogni handles it for you. Just a few months after signing up, Incogni has already gotten my details removed from 19 of these data brokers, with 35 more in progress. And I didn't have to do anything after signing up. So check out Incogni using the link below, or go to incogni.com slash uncensored. The first 100 people to use the code uncensored will get 20% off. Get your personal data off the market with Incogni. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching China Uncensored.